starting. We can... So good evening. Um, we're just getting started here. We're going to wait for people to come in, give people a little bit time to, to join, and then we'll be starting in a few minutes. Am I still here or did I freeze? You did briefly freeze, yes. <laughs> you're actually, you're frozen right now, but we can hear you. I wonder if he exits and enters again, Jenny, do you think it would help? I have no idea. Mm -hmm. I try it. <laughs> We're having connection problems. So yeah, good evening to everyone who is here. We'll be getting started shortly. Um, Matt is having some connection difficulties. So we're, uh, he was here and we're hoping he'll be back soon. You're back. <laughs> But now we have no audio. Oh, no, now we do. Yep. OK. It looks like it looks like we've got a fair number of people in. I'll just give them one more minute to, to join, and then we will get started. All right, well, we'll give it a try, hopefully. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this presentation by archeologist Matt Walls. I'm Genevieve Lemoyne, curator of the Perry McMillan Arctic Museum, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you all and our guest this evening. I first want to begin with a brief acknowledgement that I'm speaking to you from my office at the museum at Bowdoin College in Brunswick, Maine, which is the traditional homeland of the Wabanaki, the people of the Dawnland, who are today comprised of the Maliseet, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy and Penobscot peoples. We are grateful for their ancient and ongoing stewardship of this land. For those who would like to learn more about Wabanaki culture, I encourage you to visit the Bowdoin College Museum of Arts exhibit, Innovation and Resilience Across Three Generations of Wabanaki Basket Making, curated by members of the Native American Students Association here. It's on view in the museum until September 18th, and there's a rich online exhibit element as well for those who are not on campus. Now, some organizational details. Um, all attendees are muted. So while you can see and hear us, at least we hope you can, um, we can't see or hear you. We do want your participation, however. Um, 
there will be time for questions at the end. So please type your questions into the chat. So you can see a link at the bottom of your screen. I can't, of course, guarantee that we'll get to all of them in the hour that we have, but hopefully we can answer many of them. Uh, we will have live captioning on. You can see it, to see it, you can turn it, turn it on on your screen with the live transcript button also at the bottom of your screen. And finally, this event is being recorded and will be available on our website in a couple of weeks after closed captioning is, is uh, cleaned up. So um, if you have colleagues or friends who have missed the event, they will still have a chance to see it. Now, it is my very great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Matthew Walls, Associate Professor in the Department of Anthropology and Archaeology at the University of Calgary. Matt's interest in the North began many years ago when he was first at the University of Calgary, as it was there that he did his bachelor's and his master's degrees before moving to the University of Toronto, where he completed his PhD with a really very interesting dissertation looking at the development of kayaking skills among Greenlandic kayakers, contemporary kayakers, learning to kayak, learning to build a kayak, those kinds of things, and the ways that these skills interact with their perceptions of their environment, and the implications of this also for the archaeological record. Since returning to Calgary, he's continued to study the ways people interact and respond to environmental change with a project in Northwest Greenland. And this is another terrific project. It's a collaboration with colleagues in Canada and in Greenland. They work closely with community members and it has a very innovative social media presence as well. And there's a link to their Facebook page um, or Facebook, it's not really a page, their Facebook link on the, in the chat, which you can, uh, I really strongly encourage you to go look at it. There's lots of stuff in there. Some, they did a really amazing, digital field season when the pandemic prevented them from going into the field. Um, and there's some very, very interesting stuff in there. So please go check that out. Of course, all of us have been, all of our work in the North has been sever severely curtailed by the pandemic, but they really um, managed to continue on in uh, a very innovative way. So tonight, Matt, together with his colleague, Mari Kleist of the University of Greenland, who could not join us tonight, We'll talk about some of the remarkable archaeological sites they've documented as part of this project and take us through some of the implications these sites have for the way the earliest inhabitants of this region interacted with their environment. The pay, his presentation is titled Voyage to Ketisusut, Early Watercraft and Species Relationships in Avernas Aver I can never say it right, Avernaswak, Northwest Greenland. Um, and it's uh, it links nicely to our kayak exhibit and also to our long-standing interest uh, in this region. So Matt, I will turn it over to you and we'll see the rest of you back here with questions at the end. Uh, great, thank you, Jenny. Um, is the presentation's working now? Um, I, I will say from the start, I've been having a couple of problems just recently with the internet connection. So if I drop out, just, just hang on and I'll, I'll be back in a couple of minutes, hopefully. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is, is um, some archaeological work we've been doing at a, a very unique place called Kitsisut. Um, it's in northernmost Greenland, um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that work, which is mostly in progress. Um, it's been stalled a little bit by uh, some of the uh, delays with fieldwork because of the pandemic and, and things like that. Um, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the wider environment that, that it's a part of, um, what we're kind of discovering in, in the archaeology, and then I'll kind of close with some comments about some of the sh uh, perspective that I think it shifts in terms of thinking about some of the environmental histories in, in this, this part of Greenland. So I'll, I'll begin by talking a little bit about um, what's kind of unique about the environment that, that we're looking at. Um, but I'm also representing um, today kind of a bigger research team that, that, that's involved in this. Um, as, as, as Jenny said, I, I, I currently direct the project with Mari Kleist. Um, uh, at the, she's at the University of Calgary and the University of Greenland. Um, and we started the project um, a few years back in 2017 with Paulina Knudsen and uh, Naotaka Hayashi, who were kind of involved in, in the beginning part of the project and, and much of the field work that, that you'll see here as well. Um, so our project is called the Anuhut Creativity and Environmental Responsiveness uh, Project, or ICER. And um, it focuses on uh, this part of Greenland, which you can see, it might be kind of hidden under kind of the, the picture of my head talking there. So you might have to move it around, uh, but we're 
way up in uh, Northwest Greenland and kind of looking at an area that's not limited to Greenland that actually stretches across to the Canadian side to Ellesmere Island. Um, and we're particularly focused on um, the relationship between the Inuhuit community and this um, kind of wider environmental phenomena uh, called uh, Picula Sosuak or the North Water Polynia. Um, so polynias, um, if you uh, haven't heard the term before, are uh, parts of the Arctic where you have um, an expanse of open water that's open through uh, different parts of the winter. Um, so uh, Picula Sosuak, uh, the North Water, is the largest um, such polynia in, in, the, in the Arctic, um, and it's a very, very important um, uh, kind of locus of different ecological relationships across the high Arctic. Uh, you can see it in this image here. It's that sort of expanse of open water stretching between uh, Greenland on the right and, and Ellesmere on, uh, on the left there. Um, and it's, of course, bisected by the modern border, but it's sort of the wider hole that, that's part of the traditional territory of, um, of, of the Inuit. Um, so I'm going to start off with a, a little bit of kind of a overview of some of the exciting things that are happening in, in, in both kind of the paleoecology, archaeology, and, and political ecology of, of, of this area. So um, in terms of some of the, the recent um, kind of uh, wider work in the environmental sciences on, on the um, dynamics of the polynia, um, it, it's really quite an interesting kind of picture that's starting to emerge on, on its history. Um, so uh, the polynia is a really important um, ecological hotspot. It um, uh, acts as kind of a refugia for different sea mammals um, that uh, kind of uh, make use of the different ice scapes around its edges. Um, it's also kind of a, a place where there's large uh, phytoplankton blooms and, and huge migrations of, of seabirds and, and other sea mammals that kind of converge on the region um, in, in uh, kind of the warmer seasons as well. So it's, it's a place with a rich local ecology, but one that's also fairly precarious too. Um, there's a variety of factors that hold the polynia environment together, um, uh, mostly tied to kind of the formation of the ice bridge and uh, currents, as well as the um, kind of movement of wind. Um, but it, it is kind of a very important place um, in terms of understanding high Arctic environments. Um, it's the kind of wider landscape, of course, was exposed um, in the early Holocene by kind of the retreating um, Inuition and, and Greenland ice sheets. And some of the kind of recent um, work on marine sediments and paleoecological cores um, is starting to kind of build a very interesting picture on the early um, uh, kind of history of the Polynesian environment. So in terms of how we understand it today is this sort of um, rich open water area uh, that seems to be realized uh, by about 4,400 years ago. Um, some of the other interesting things happening in the paleoecological uh, have to do with the kind of environment and, and the wider kind of um, environments that are kind of surrounding it and attached to it. So the um, uh, terrestrial environments are very closely related to what's happening in the polynia. Um, and there's been a lot of kind of interesting work that puts a couple of interest readings if, if you're particularly interested in um, uh, seabirds and dynamic ecologies. Uh, but it's, it's looking at kind of the, the importance of seabirds in terms of cycling nutrients onto kind of the landscape as well, and the position that so certain species play in terms of the emergence of different um, uh, uh, vegetations as well. So um, there's been a lot of work recently on uh, dove keys um, as well as thick-billed muir. And uh, there's kind of a sense that we can view these as, as sort of engineer species or, or creative um, aspects of, of the ecology that are um, very important in terms of uh, understanding the wider region that's connected by, by the, the stability of that polynia. And then, of course, in the archaeology, there's uh, been a lot of um, fairly um, you know, great projects that, that do a lot of, uh, that have built kind of a foundation. Looks like I disappeared there for a bit. Am I back? Hmm. I'm not, it's a little bit unclear from my side whether I'm, I'm actually um, you're, back. You're back, but your screen share is not. There we go. OK. Um, how long was I gone? <laughs> Um, 
Well, what I was talking about was was the kind of um, kind of brief history of archaeological work. There's been a, a variety of um, uh, really important projects um, on the, the Canadian side, uh, the work by Peter Sliderman and Karen McCullough on the, um, uh, in kind of uh, uh, the, the Elsmere side. Uh, then of course, uh, work by Jen, uh, Jenny Lemoyne and, and uh, Christiane Darwin in, in Inglefield land. And then uh, kind of more recent project, uh, the, um, uh, the Danish National Museum and Bjarni Grono's team. Um, and so there's kind of a foundation of great um, archaeological work that we're able to work with. Um, it depends on where you draw kind of the, the border around this, um, the, the Polinia region, uh, but there's a little bit over 500 archaeological sites um, with, with, you know, kind of extensive information about uh, the types of activities that have taken place there through time. And in terms of kind of the development of, of kind of the archaeology of of the region, it's kind of an interesting moment to kind of step back and think about how all these different um, areas fit together and understand that the history of the Pliny is a, a sort of an integrated whole. Um, so both the archaeology and paleoecology more important in terms of, of some of that work. Um, there's It looks like we're having some trouble here. I'm not sure. Um, can somebody let me know if you're able to hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Matt. Sorry, it looks like I keep cutting out. This is this is really too bad. Um, we're having. I'm not sure what the issue is here at Calgary today. But. Okay, it looks like you're back now, Matt. Okay, all right. Okay, it's uh, not, not quite clear. Um, uh, but anyways, I was talking about kind of a recent um, uh, process underway uh, that, that completed the, the Picula Sosrat Commission that made um, kind of a lot of recommendations about the future of, of kind of a governance over, over um, the wider Polynesian environment and the importance of sort of um, uh, operating and, and kind of um, thinking about conservation in terms of under. That, that are kind of caused by that border, as well as some of the imposed uh, regulations uh, from kind of the, uh, the wider world. So when we kind of set up our, our project, uh, it was kind of with, with this sort of um, frontier in mind in terms of research and where research can connect uh, with, with some of the processes that are happening in, in and kind of the intention on, on the high Arctic. Um, and we got off into to a great start in our project. Um, so we, um, a lot of the work that we were doing kind of revolved around community interviews and oral history, um, kind of focused on the importance of archaeology in, in the present and, and community visions for the future as well. Uh, we did a lot of work thinking about the representation of archaeology and how it can kind of connect with um, this kind of renewed need to kind of understand the, the deeper human history of um, uh, the, the relationship between the Nuhuat and, and their close relatives and ancestors um, and the Polynesian environment. Um, and in addition to that, we did a lot of survey as well. So it, uh, this busy looking um, map behind you there, uh, it's highlighting some of the areas where we conducted somewhat extensive surveys. Um, in some cases, there are areas where there are known sites, but um, maybe not a lot of information about them. And in other cases, there are places that haven't been surveyed before. So we did a fair bit of work um, uh, looking at those landscapes and, and determining what kind of archaeological features are there. However, we ran into kind of a, a big problem, um, of course, in 2020, where we ran into disruptions of, uh, in field work. And so we've been through now two years where we had to cancel field work and are kind of in a, a process of, of rebuilding and, and regrouping, uh, which I'll talk about uh, a little more at the, the end of the, um, the talk. 
And so what I, within that work that we've been doing, what I wanted to kind of focus on, um, because I think some of the most interesting stuff is, is coming out of this, is um, a, a, a survey trip that we did to Kitsisut, which is, you can see it um, uh, down in the lower right here. It's this uh, chain of tiny islands that are uh, somewhat difficult to access. So I'll, I'll be talking about the difficulty of getting there a fair bit. Um, but uh, one of the things that, that makes Kitsisut special is its association with um, a uh, species of seabird called thick-billed muir. Um, it's uh, an important nesting location for them. Um, it's located well within the, the heart of the Polynya um, and, and really the only kind of major significant discussions with, with community members. There was uh, kind of a sense that um, uh, it, period for a minute there. Um, so there, uh, where I, uh, are you able to hear me, Jenny? Yes. Okay, good. Yeah. So I, I am back. Um, so there, there was a little bit of a prior uh, archaeological work at Kitsisut. There was a, a small excavation in 1939, um, and then uh, a, a briefer survey in, in 1980. And there, there's been some uh, kind of visits by different archaeologists and um, uh, community members over the years too that kind of uh, kind of created a sense that there's a lot of archaeological features there but we didn't really have a very clear idea of, of what those are indicates so there was kind of a lot of open questions to getting there um, that, that kind of led us to getting there um, one of the challenges though in, in doing that and I think one of the reasons why it hasn't really been visited a lot in the past um, is is just because of the access. Um, uh, I'll describe this a little bit later, but it is quite difficult to get um, to Kitsisut. There are um, challenges even with kind of modern powered watercraft, um, things like that. Uh, but we were able to run a short survey field season in, tw in uh, 2019. Um, so there's a team of eight of us uh, that, that managed to get out there from uh, the University of Greenland in Calgary, as well as some community partners, um, uh, so you can see Mari and, and Paulina here, as well as uh, Pia and Pavinguak, uh, two of the students who played a very important role in, in the project. Um, and then also uh, important community uh, partners, Kalasak, um, Niels and, and Otto um, here. And we were able to get out to Kitsisut uh, partly through the help of a, a really neat program that the Danish Navy runs that supports research scientists in, in um, difficult places to, to access in, in Greenland. Um, so it's called the JCO program. And uh, they actually hoisted the hunter's boats onto the ship and, and took us out to uh, the islands, uh, which is kind of a, a rare and great opportunity um, uh, in any archaeological area. Matt, why don't you try turning off your video? You should still be able to share your screen. Did I? Okay. I'm afraid I keep cutting out. This is, uh, I think we'll, we'll sort of get, <laughs> I hope I don't miss anything too important, but the, um, what I was saying is that it's a great uh, program uh, that, that does support scientists getting to these kinds of places. Um, so over a four day period, we were able to conduct uh, some fairly extensive survey at, at Kitsisut. Um, it's, um, uh, there's only a few places that are really suitable to have archeological sites there. Uh, they're you know, kind of sheer cliffs going into the ocean in many places, uh, very rough coastline, things like that. Um, and we were able to locate prior sites and also find a lot uh, more material than, than was previously recorded. Um, but it was, it was really quite an interesting season to be out there because there's so much interesting archaeology there. Um, I think we, we barely slept at all because um, just we're constantly kind of looking at different features and trying to um, uh, record them. Um, you know, I've, I've worked in a lot of different places in the Arctic and, and for me this is, is one of the most interesting sites that, that, that I've ever been to. Um, and, and we wow. it's kind of a quick summary of, of, of what we kind of saw overall. Um, 
it's a very dense archaeological landscape at, at Kitsisut. Um, in the short time we were there, we were Matt, why don't you turn your video off to save bandwidth and you should still be able to share your screen. Yeah. Um, okay, I think it kicked me off again. Um, okay, so so we, we, we found lots of archaeological features, um, all kinds of things like caches, cairns, um, uh, different types of architectural features uh, like that, um, and all sort of located around five major localities. Um, in terms of very general observations of, uh, about the site as a whole, um, there's very con strong correlation for where these sites are and the, the nesting colonies. So what you're able to see in this slide is um, kind of highlighted with the green arrows, there's these kind of white cliff faces, um, and that's places where um, these mirror colonies are, are nesting during the summer, and uh, they're, they're kind of white. reason for, for why some of these sites are there, uh, but I do think there's a, a little bit more going on as well, uh, which I'll, I'll talk about in a, in a moment here. Um, another important general observation is kind of the state and, and integrity of some of the archaeological sites. Um, one of the things that's happening in a lot of archaeological landscapes across the Arctic is that um, a lot of changes related to uh, warming um, are impacting sites in a, a variety of, in, in many dramatic So you can see a couple of, of obvious examples here. So coastal erosion is, is a, a very big uh, part here. Um, up on the right here, you can see kind of a fairly um, in the middle here with the red arrow, there's a fairly large tent ring that's uh, sort of disappearing as, as the coastline um, moves, moves in on it. Um, another uh, uh, Thing that's, that's very observable is that there's a lot of changes to the active layer for um, uh, the permafrost. So there's, um, uh, you can see it in kind of some of the structures. There's a lot of kind of standing water in them. Uh, there's a, there's things like detachment slides, um, uh, those types of things that indicate that the uh, frozen layers for many of these um, uh, archaeological features are, are changing dramatically. Um, and of course, all along the beaches, there's um, uh, various different artifacts, bones, uh, things that are kind of spilling out of those archaeological layers. Um, so it is a place that, that's changing um, fairly quickly as well. Uh, now, uh, kind of the feature of, of Arctic archaeology is that a lot of, a lot of, particularly in the high Arctic, a lot of things are, are very visible on the surface. Um, so uh, we weren't able to excavate anything like or anything like that or during this field season. But just from kind of the surface identifications, it can give you a fairly good sense of, of what you're looking at in terms of uh, chronology and, and time frame. And there's at least two major um, periods that are clearly represented um, at Kitsisut. Um, uh, the first one, which I won't talk too, too much about, and, and we'll say that for another talk, is, is tied to the kind of immediate ancestors of, of the Inuhuits. So kind of from the period that's sometimes referred to in archaeology as the Thule period. So that kind of stretches from the, the medieval warming period about um, uh, kind of the 13th century. Um, and there are sites um, kind of clearly represented here into about the late 1700s. Um, lots of summer tent rings, uh, but also a lot of uh, winter dwellings as well. There's kind of uh, 12 different winter houses of different types of configurations that probably represent um, different periods. Um, in the image in the upper right, upper right here, uh, you can see a very large structure um, that uh, uh, has kind of three or four small rooms inside of it. And um, uh, you can make out there's lots of uh, whalebone kind of sticking out of it. And, um, this is a pattern you see it at a lot of kind of sites like this, where in order to build that structure, they do a lot of collecting of whalebone from other uh, winter houses and then kind of incorporate it into the structure. And so uh, probably a good indication that this might be the last um, house that, that was occupied at the site. Um, hundreds of caches uh, for, for meat, uh, things like burials, kayak stands and umiak stands. Um, 
So kind of difficult to, to imagine a community spending a whole winter out here, but, but probably some demonstration that there is um, some kind of extended season of use um, in, in terms of how uh, Kitsisut was, was used through time. Um, one of the interesting kind of open questions that, you know, if, if we don't get around to addressing it, maybe somebody else can too, is, is that some of the features that are kind of associated with this period seem to be kind of built into older, um, some kind of older occupation as well. And, and I think one possible question is if there are actually um, archaeological features associated with the time period slightly before this, the late Dorset period. Um, that, that are possibly represented at the site as well, but the sort of thing that, that would need to be addressed through um, further excavation. But the main thing I'm gonna talk about is um, uh, kind of a series of features uh, that we found along um, kind of uh, some beach ridges very close to um, uh, the, the easternmost area in the, uh, in the, the islands that were occupied there. Um, and these are kind of associated with a period that's much older, about three and a half years older, uh, or up to that anyways, um, uh, than that, that kind of um, Inuhuit period. And that, that's associated with a period called the early Paleo-Inuit uh, period. So um, if you look in this image here, just to kind of orientate you, there's the, the bird cliff up in the um, kind of center of the image there. And then in these kind of ancient beach ridges, you can almost make out some of the uh, features that, that I'm going to be talking about uh, down below. And to give you kind of a closer look, it can kind of take a little bit of practice to, to kind of see, uh, see these kinds of images. But this is um, a, a tent ring. It's kind of, um, you can kind of make out the bilobate structure. Um, and there's a couple of things going on in the middle that I'll, I'll show you some diagrams of in, in a moment here. Um, that kind of raises the question as to what exactly do we mean by uh, early paleo inuits so um, archaeology is kind of going in the arctic anyways is going through kind of a, a process of rethinking some of the terminology used for different periods and maybe even in the background behind that some of the the categories that that, that we kind of you know, typically break the the past up into to different chunks um, and by the early Paleoinuit period, we, we mean the, the absolute kind of earliest horizon of, of communities kind of roughly in a period between 4,400 to about 2,700 years ago. Um, if you're kind of familiar with some of the um, classic publications on this, uh, the terms like Independence One and Sakak and Pre-Dorset, um, I'm not sure that all archaeologists will agree with me, but um, certainly for the context of the, the high Arctic um, in this area, um, I, We've sort of done a lot of look, looking at all these different sites together and their, their uh, assemblages and, and thinking very carefully if, if some of these divisions make much sense in terms of the particular area that we're dealing with. And so one of the ways that we're kind of thinking about that right now is to just kind of conflate them and, and, and call them all the early paleo in a period for now anyways, until we're able to kind of look at that in a bit more detail. So in terms of uh, what, what some uh, the quantities of features and things like that, um, there are about um, uh, 18 um, of these kind of tent dwelling features that, that we associate with that early Paleo period. And then specifically within that, there's a series of features that are kind of very distinctive that are um, these kind of, they're called bilobate uh, features. So you can see here, they have kind of um, sort of a, almost a double ring with this kind of, um, it's some kind, it's called an axial mid, mid feature that sort of bisects it down the middle. Um, in the middle of that, there's sometimes a hearth feature. Um, and in kind of the wider discussion of these, there's uh, lots of different ideas about how they're kind of used to divide space and things like that. Um, when we left in 2019, the intent was to, to immediately come back and do some excavation of one or two of these features to kind of uh, understand them a little bit better with, with the benefit of, of, you know, a good assemblage of, of bone and um, uh, lithic tools and things like that. Uh, we didn't really get that opportunity um, in the end, but we did, um, there was kind of a couple features there where there were some disturbances where there was kind of exposures of, of materials coming out of those, and we did collect some uh, bone from those and did run um, a date on uh, a bone that was identified as um, a thick build mirror uh, fragment. Um, a seabird bone, of course, is very problematic to date in terms of radiocarbon dating because of the uh, marine uh, reservoir effect. Um, sometimes you can uh, kind of account for that through the marine calibration curves and um, R values and things like that. Um, and there is some, some good um, 
uh, kind of publications about kind of different R values to use for this area. But because seabirds move between uh, vast regions and then also there is complications with kind of the amount of currents and kind of movement of water in this particular area that, that make some of those values quite, quite difficult to apply. Um, all that to say that, that we, the date that came out of this fits very nicely into that early paleo Inuit period, but we don't interpret it as being that meaningful uh, within that. So in terms of differentiating where within the early paleo Inuit period we are, but because those axial features are sometimes show up again in other periods, um, we did uh, kind of take it to be kind of a part, part of kind of strengthening the interpretation that we are in fact dealing with, with this broader early paleo Inuit period. Um, one of the kind of questions that, that kind of um, would, would come up in archaeology is, is, you know, if there is possibility to kind of make a more precise kind of diagnostic suggestion as to what kind of community within the broader paleo Inuit world um, with these, these features might be kind of associated with. And in particular, there's kind of an entity called Independence One that's um, associated more with kind of, it's named after the Independence Fjords in, in Northern Greenland that make for, or kind of, we're making very similar structures to this. And um, you do, do see them fairly well represented on the, the Canadian side in, in Ellesmere. Um, but without kind of an excavation and kind of an assemblage to kind of address that further, um, it's difficult to say. And, and as I, I said before, it's not necessarily that clear to me if it's if that meaningful a definition within uh, the specific area that, that we're working in and, and maybe is something that, that there will be a little bit more kind of um, reassessment of um, uh, in the near future. However, kind of understood as, as early paleo Inuit features, there's kind of a lot that can be said about the position of, of, of the site and, and um, its relationship to what we know about other early paleo Inuit occupations um, in the wider uh, Polynia environments. So um, in the, this image here, you have a couple of charts um, just to kind of get a sense of how Kitsisut fits into um, uh, some of the other sites in, in the area. Um, so in the first one, it, it's kind of uh, tabulating the amount of um, uh, dwelling features at, at different um, pa uh, sites that are identified as being really paleo Inuit. Um, and as you can see here, Kitsisut is in the top five. Uh, so that's out of 95 uh, sites that have at least one or more um, uh, early paleo Inuit features. Um, so there's kind of that outlier at uh, Kekotarak um, uh, in uh, kind of the edge of Inglefield land. Uh, but the, the rest of these features, all, are, other sites are kind of all very similar in terms of the, the number of um, uh, paleo Inuit dwellings that they have. And then if you just look at features with those axial structures, um, uh, Kitsisut is, is then in the top three of, of 37 that, that, are, that we're aware of in, in, in the wider region. So one of the things I think that, that kind of tells us about Kitsisut is that, that it, it's not kind of an outlier in terms of the way that early paleo communities are interacting with the Pelplany environment. Um, it is a fairly large site in, in the grand scheme of the wider region. Um, and important in, in understanding um, kind of the relationship between um, those kind of wider communities and the Polynia environment. And that raises kind of a very ob obvious question, which is, is how did they get there? Um, so in this image, we're, it's taken from a drone, so it's uh, about a, 100 meters up in the air. And you can see the site in the foreground uh, here with those beach ridges, and then some of the key um, uh, features in, in the wider uh, uh, landscape, uh, kind of features in the wider regions, the kind of chain of islands in the, the um, uh, Connacht Fjords area. And then probably under my, my talking head there, you can see um, kind of showing roughly where uh, Old Nulit is, which is kind of a, a very important um, uh, early paleo Inuit site um, that, that would be the closest um, in terms of uh, direct um, uh, line of, of sight. Um, this is a very rare image, I think, because um, the, the weather uh, often is, it, it's very rare to have good weather like this in, in this area. Um, Kitsisut is often usually kind of shrouded in fog, fog um, uh, kind of very kind of other types of limitations on, on visibility, things like that. Um, in the present, it's, it's quite a, a journey to get here, even by um, kind of powered watercraft. Um, and we're, you know, you do, do need watercraft to get there. There's no point in the year where there's kind of um, an ice connection. And that kind of raises the question, would 
Uh, this have also been the case uh, during the early Paleo-Minoic period, um, during that early kind of development of the Polynian environment. Um, our, our current understanding is that, that it absolutely would have been kind of an open water environment just as today that would have required um, uh, travel by watercraft in order to access this. So um, between kind of the, the mainland and Greenland here and what we're looking across, there's a, a drop in the seafloor, a little bit over 900 meters in some places. Um, and there's, there's currents moving in there, bringing kind of Atlantic modal water through. Uh, things like that. And if kind of the current understandings of the Polynia dynamics um, about 4,400 years ago are, are um, as we understand them, that, that it, it wouldn't have been um, kind of possible to connect through through ice. So, so they are accessing this uh, by, a, by a watercraft. And that kind of um, can give us a little bit of insight into what kind of features of those watercraft might, might have been. Um, so in terms of the wider early Paleo-Inuit period for this region, there aren't a lot of great sites that have, um, you know, really good organic preservation, large assemblages or middens, things like that, that um, would kind of, you know, be an environment where you might have fragments of watercraft produced, but we can kind of take an inferential look at some of the characteristics that, that they might have had if they're traveling to uh, places like Kitsisut. Um, so some of the obvious challenges, a very strong current, um, uh, very strong crosswind, um, also a lot of potential for changing weather in this environment. Um, anyone who works in the area or, or has visited uh, knows it can change very quickly and stay that way for weeks at a time. Um, so, uh, and Kitsisut in particular is often kind of um, uh, behind fog, um, uh, things like that. In kind of talking with some of the traditional kayakers, um, we kind of have a rough estimate of about 15 to 16 hours of difficult paddling to cross um, uh, here in sort of a modern West Greenlandic kayak. Um, uh, so, if, and that, that's sort of an optimistic view without um, significant breaks, um, uh, kind of other kind of complications, things like that. Um, and so to kind of take that in, in kind of a comparative perspective, um, we sort of spent some time looking at other contexts across the early Paleo-Inuit world that um, uh, if there are other examples where there may have been kind of similar crossings made. Um, and as far as we're aware, I think Kitsisut is probably by far the furthest distance that, that we can see um, early Paleo-Inuit communities must have crossed open water in order to access. Um, just for comparison, to, to get across the Bering Strait, for example, um, that's sort of a minimum of, of 36 kilometers um, at, uh, you know, so, so even that is kind of a, a smaller trip than, than this particular one. Um, and then if we kind of compare that to kind of more kind of um, ethnographic perspectives on circumpolar kayak use and umiak use by um, uh, kind of later Inuit communities, it kind of helps us to kind of understand the character of this journey as well. Um, there's a lot of variation in terms of types of kayaks and, and their uh, performance characteristics, as well as umiaks as well, and uh, varieties of different types of scenarios through which they're used. And if we can kind of think of that as, that, as sort of a continuum uh, with some communities only using them traditionally for uh, very kind of short periods, uh, perhaps a couple of weeks during the summer, uh, whereas, whereas other communities at the other side of this, uh, this continuum um, using them Throughout the year, uh, places like West Greenland, uh, where they're very important, uh, even through the cold seasons. Um, probably not all of those um, examples from an ethnographic context would be capable of this, this type of journey. Um, you have to have certain types of hull characteristics and, and um, uh, a variety of other um, kind of considerations um, in order to be able to make that type of journey. And so um, it, it's probably in that extreme, um, side of the continuum, places like West Greenland or parts of Alaska where uh, there's heavy use of, of kayaks and, and umiaks uh, that would be comparable in, in terms of the, the ability to make this trip. Um, you have to be able to deal with, with cross, crosswind, um, kind of uh, complications with, with weather, and presumably also to, to um, transport cargo or, or people across. Um, it, it doesn't seem as though these are kind of small um, kind of gatherings at this site when you have kind of multiple um, uh, dwelling features and things like that. It may have been kind of entire segments of community making the crossing. 
Um, so another important feature of that comparison uh, to um, kind of um, kind of the ethnographic context of different Inuit communities that, that use skin on frame watercraft as well is, is the importance of kind of the skill in the community as well. Um, for those communities that are using kayaks um, throughout the year and, and very, very heavily reliant on them, there's a big emphasis on, on kind of the processes of learning and um, the, the technology is very close to kind of the center of social life, right? Um, so um, it kind of gives us, if, if there's kind of a comparison to be made to those early paleo communities that could reach Kitsisut, it's sort of suggested that they, they kind of fall into that kind of extreme continuum in terms of the maritime focus of, of the community um, and, and its center at, uh, at being kind of center at the center of social life as well. And I think that kind of maybe shifts perspective on early paleo communities in the hierarchy a little bit. Um, there's always been kind of a, a little bit of a sense, maybe kind of a tacit assumption that one of the things that makes them kind of different than uh, later um, Inuhuit and, and their ancestors um, is that sort of dependence on, on watercraft and kind of the marine focus of, of different life ways. Uh, particularly around Independence One, there's kind of a strong association with things like musk ox hunting, things like that. This sort of paints a very different picture um, and, and maybe something more similar to um, other early paleo communities that we know did have a very uh, strong maritime focus, such as um, Sakak in, in West Greenland, where there are actually sites with very good preservation and in a couple cases, even fragments of watercraft preserved in those, those contexts. And in some cases would be roughly contemporary with, with the, the period that, that we're dealing with. So one of the things that does, does seem clear to, to me anyways, um, in kind of the, just the presence of those features at Kitsisut is that the community that was able to travel there certainly had reach across um, uh, different terrestrial and marine um, systems in the wider pl Pliny environment. So there's nowhere in kind of that wider Pliny environment that's, that's quite out of their reach, right? They are able to kind of access sea mammals and seabirds and um, uh, uh, with, with you know, uh, some efficiency. And kind of putting that in perspective of, of what the sort of the picture emerging in, in the paleoecology and, um, and archaeology of, of the region where we can think about its, its early developmental history, this is probably a very sensitive time period in terms of the initial conditions of this, this complicated environment. Um, the uh, choices and decisions and actions that these early paleo communities are making potentially have a lot of um, uh, influence in terms of structuring some of the uh, types of um, ecological relationships that still define the area today. Um, in the paleoecology, um, uh, th there's kind of this, this interest in um, certain species as being sort of characterized as engineers or creators of, of sort of the um, uh, complicated an environment that, that sort of links the terrestrial systems with the polynia. Um, and I wonder if there's sort of a horizon of work um, that, that, that could be kind of um, pulled into focus that, that looks at um, uh, the potential for these earliest paleo communities to also play kind of a very important creative role in, in those ecological systems. So there, there is kind of a, a critical need, I think, for more partnered work between um, uh, the Inuhuit community and archaeologists and, and paleoecologists. And, and I think that we're already starting to see that as, as sort of a character of some of the uh, research projects that, that are, are underway in, in the region. So for us, um, what's, what's next in terms of the project? Um, as I said at the start, and, and I think um, all archaeologists and, and other field-based um, research, researchers are kind of coping with this too in the Arctic, is that we're sort of regrouping from kind of a couple seasons of, of putting all the logistics in place and then sort of undoing that um, as well. And there's a lot of kind of follow-on complications from that in terms of uh, keeping members of research teams evolve, uh, involved and um, as well as kind of the, the sort of frameworks for community work that, that, that um, uh, took a long time to build as well. Uh, my hope is that there will eventually be uh, excavations at, at Kitsusut to kind of get a better understanding of, of what's represented here. I think there's a lot of kind of insight into that early history of the Polynia that, that could be gained through, through that kind of work. Um, one of the things that I think is, is very important um, uh, uh, in, in the near future for the region is to think about a prioritization of types of archaeological work, um, because um, as, as you can see, there is this concern for damage and change to archaeological sites. 
Um, and there's a little bit of kind of discussion in the wider Arctic community about um, what to do about all these um, archaeological sites that are under threat. And um, there's maybe some discussion about kind of emergency measures, things like that, but it may be important to have kind of a prioritization framework and uh, kind of a, um, a careful think about kind of community ethics in terms of what type of work should be done and what sort of values go into choosing that. Um, and then the other feature of our ongoing work is, is how to kind of mobilize the archaeology and, and kind of put it at the forefront of understandings of, of the environmental history here, uh, because a lot of the um, sort of external ideas for conservation often frame the idea, uh, frame the areas as sort of, um, or, or frame conservation measures as something that should separate uh, people and, and nature here. So um, that's sort of very old ideas about um, uh, the idea that, that it can kind of return to a self-balancing uh, state. Um, if you're interested in kind of the uh, kind of wider work that we're doing at some of the other sites too, there, as, um, uh, as Jenny mentioned at the start of the presentation, and I put a link in the chat, there is um, uh, a lot more kind of uh, small vignettes that kind of document some of the work that we're doing that um, are, are available. We kind of present them through a Facebook group and it's a way of kind of linking to things like videos and images and um, 3D models and stuff like that. So there is um, a lot of ways to access um, any, any of that kind of stuff. Um, so anyways, um, uh, it's unfortunate I kept cutting out and I hope most of uh, what, what I was wanting to get across came through. Um, I have a suspicion there might have been big gaps when when I wasn't um, when I was talking, but 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 uh, uh, you weren't able to hear me. Um, so I guess we'll find out in the um, in the discussion. So I'm happy to kind of answer any questions or, or tell you a little bit more about um, uh, what we're doing and thinking on on the area as well. Um, well, thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Matt. That was really really interesting, and I think we missed a few little bits, but not too much of what you were saying when the, the internet was breaking down on us. But uh, no, I think it's really, it's fantastic work. I'm, I'm particularly, I, I really like your, your thoughts about um, kind of looking at the co-development of the, the ecosystem and human cultures in the region. And I'm wondering, are, I'm excited to think that you might be going back there and doing some work one of the things I remember that the, the Bjarne's project, the NOW project was doing where they were dating the, um, the bird colonies with, they were coring, I think the peats and dating them. Is that something you're thinking about as well out there? Absolutely, there has been some, some great coring and paleoecological work from Cary Islands and some of those understandings of the, the histories of the bird colonies do come from from this particular area. Um, and you know, I think, think that that's certainly something we're very interested in, but, but will involve some kind of new partnerships as well. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. But yeah, it looks, the, all that whalebone, it looks really exciting and lots and lots of, it's, and, and I also understand the, the concerns and it would be really interesting to know how the community felt about prioritizing things because certainly as probably many of the people listening here no, we were working, you know, we were focusing our work on the stuff that's falling into the ocean now. There's tons of really, in Inglefield land, tons of really great paleo Inuit stuff as well. And we just figured for now it's safe, so we would leave it. But also, I don't know if you want to just quickly tell people about some of your other work that's shown that just because a site isn't at sea level doesn't mean it's safe. No, absolutely, yeah. Um, in the, <laughs> yeah, that that's absolutely true. So, in, at at Kitsisut, it's mostly coastal erosion and, and melting permafrost. But um, in some of the areas that that we, other areas that we've been working in, there there's a lot of um, different kind of mass movement processes as well: landslides, active layer detachments, um, uh, debris flows, things like that 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 are taking out large sections of sites. And then, of course, because you have all the that material moving into being transported by, by small streams and stuff like that. The um, sites that are on alluvial fans are, are kind of getting um, buried very quickly as well. So um, in some cases, they're, you know, kind of sudden rainfall events over a couple of years trigger major changes that, that decimate very large percentages of, of the landscape very quickly. Yeah, it's a, it's a really one of many terrifying situations going on up there right now. Um, 
we did a lot of traveling to different places um, that community identity community members identify as being really important and, and kind of quite concerned about the changes happening to them. So, yeah. so it is it's certainly something that, that there's a lot of concern about, particularly I think in terms of the value these sites have in terms of demonstrating the kind of longer term histories in, in that environment um, and the importance of, of having kind of um, regulatory frameworks that take that history into account. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's really great work. And I'm, would encourage you all now, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. I know there's, I see one, David, hi, David. <laughs> David Schultz is, uh, has asked about, um, are there any possible stopping places to get out when you're going out to Kisisut? Are there any stopping places or is it just open water? Um, it, it's mostly open water. It, it really, uh, the seafloor really drops. Um, in terms of the chain of islands, there's a couple of outliers that you could potentially shave five, eight kilometers off the trip but they're not very easy to land on um so it really is kind of if if you could go direct uh, given the current um it, it's a minimum 56 kilometers or so um to to, to, to cross that um and I, I suspect probably what, what's happening is they might actually be using the current to come from places further north um something like that might make a bit more sense okay and so here's a question from marianne stop hello marianne um she says, as an ethnohistoric comparative from elsewhere in the North Atlantic, the Funk Islands, about 60 kilometers off Cape Friels on the north central coast of Newfoundland, were a destination for Beothic for ox. They reached those islands in their unique birch bark canoes with the raised stem and stern and central raised shear that handled wave action. So that's oh, that. sort of to your characteristics of the watercraft, eh? That, that's a really interesting comment. Thank you. And, and uh, I'm actually just going to cut and paste that so I can keep track. <laughs> uh, that, that's, that's, um, yeah, that, that, that's quite a distance, uh, to, to, especially with birch bark canoe and kind of an open deck uh, thing like that. Um, I, I know elsewhere in, Nunavut, uh, in, in, in Newfoundland too, there is kind of, um, there certainly were trips in the Dorset period being made to San Pierre and Miquelon, um, which is also kind of a fairly big distance, but, but not quite as comparable as 60 kilometers. So that, that really is quite the, mm -hmm. uh, the trip. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm interested about actually the winter houses. I mean, yeah. are there evidence, you don't have to have children just because you have a winter house. Are there evidence of like whole families and, and a community really spending weeks at a time there in a winter house? Is there, are there any play features or other things like that you know i don't think um we, we recorded play features there um th these are things you often see at other sites like little tiny houses or kayak outlines things like that that's not to say that they're not there um but i think um you know it's the sort of thing i think an excavation um could could address certainly the uh, material culture from Lethbridge's excavation. There's lots of miniatures and things like that that are potentially associated with children. Uh, obviously, kind of a point of discussion in archaeology. But, but um, uh, you know, those are very large houses and, and features that are there. And, and I think uh, it seems to me very likely that whole families are are getting out there. But it, but it's hard to imagine sort of the. Uh, kind of careful timing and um, attention to weather. And you can imagine you know, on both sides of the trip, kind of <laughs> whether you're going to load your family in and, and, and do that kind of trip. Um, yeah. You kind of, uh, even just for a research team, it can be quite stressful kind of thinking through those types of things. Yeah. 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 Is there any chance if you're going to, this is a logistical question, just for my own interest, if you're going to be doing work out there, are you going to go out by boat or are you going to go out by helicopter? Uh, I, 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 I don't think we'll go this summer, but, but the, uh, the last two years we were offered support again by Dan the Danish Navy uh, both okay. times we tried to come out it. And I think if we went again, that's exactly how we would do it. Um, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's kind of cheating. And <laughs> oh, it's great. It's, 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 I think it's a much better. It's your Peter Schleiderman's uh, stories about the, you know, kind of the, the work that they would do where they get, get dropped off for huge periods of time and, and things like yeah. that. And you know, we, we had kind of a, a ship in very close proximity in case there were any emergencies and, and things mm. like that. It, yeah. It certainly changes the way that you could do work a lot. Yeah. And we're very appreciative 
of, of that opportunity. Yeah. Um, so as long as it's there, we'll take it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, that's fantastic. Yeah. 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 So are there any other? This is where not seeing the audience is a challenge. Are there, are there any other questions coming? Yes. Um, here's one from Fred. Hi, Fred. Randall. Um, he asks, could the currents be used to shorten the trip paddling, as he says, downhill? I, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. And and um, I, I think it's very probable that at least kind of starting the journey, uh, maybe up somewhere up by like a Parswit or Hakluyt Island and uh, Kiatak, places like that, that might be kind of a, a possibility. Um, one of the interesting things is about those, the distribution of those sites with axial features is that they're mostly on the Canadian side. Uh, there's a couple on the Greenland side, but they're mostly over there. Um, so I think it's very probable that rather than trying to cut across the shortest distance, um, it, it would be easier to do that um, in, in both ways. I, I think that's a, a very plausible uh, way of thinking about it. Is there, I know that it's still a difficult journey, right? Yeah, they're, they're obviously much closer to Greenland than they are to Ellesmere Island, but is there, is it an easier crossing to Ellesmere by any chance? Like, is there any chance they were coming from Ellesmere? I think it's possible. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, it would be a long trip, a very long yeah. trip. But you would have the current. You would have the current with you, um, and then getting back wouldn't be. <laughs> you'd have to go the long <laughs> okay. way back yeah. to to Inglefield and then cross to Pem, Pem Island or something like that. I think. Yeah, it, it would be a big commitment. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just it's a really, a really fascinating project and. Ah, we all look forward to hearing more about it. And so hopefully we'll have you back here and maybe get you be here in person to talk. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and I, I, I meant to kind of plug the, the images from the Crocker expedition too on, on your website because they there's such beautiful images of Inuit collecting eggs. Um, yes. Oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. That, that really kind of puts some of the stuff in, in perspective too. Um, very difficult. Yeah. Time. Yeah, it's when I was talking to people and I wasn't talking particularly about hunting, but the number of times they'd look at a picture and talk about some, you know, this person, oh, yes, they died getting eggs, getting birds, like, you know, they're doing all these dangerous hunting of large sea mammals and it's getting birds and eggs. That's so yeah. dangerous, really. And women and children are doing it, too, at, at some level. Yeah. 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 yeah it's, uh, it's very interesting. Yeah. Well, I think we're actually right just about up for our time. So Matt, thank you very much. Thank you for persevering through difficulties. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that had been a bit smoother, but it, but it's really fun just to talk about uh, this and, and think about it some more. And so I really appreciate the invite and, and uh, yeah. uh, that, that that offer to send me the link, by the way, for the, the BFAC um, crossing. Uh, I do appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, great. All right, well, thank you all for coming. And we'll stop the recording now. And I think that will just kick you all out and probably kick us all out as well. So, Matt, goodbye. And it was great to see you. Likewise. And I hope to talk again soon. Take care. Okay. Bye bye. <laughs>